colleagues, good afternoon. I'm very happy to see you here in the Bank of Russia. We're starting the press conference by the Bank of Russia government governor, Elvira Nabirun, and the deputy governor, Alexei Zabotkin. And to start with, we'll have the governor sharing the decisions following the board of directors meeting. Good afternoon. Today, we have decided to keep the key rate at 7.5 percent per annum. Economic activity continues to expand. Inflation trends remain moderate. Households' inflation expectations have decreased significantly while staying elevated. External conditions have worsened somewhat. Overall, risks are still shifted towards pro-inflationary ones. Therefore, as before, we believe that the key rate is more likely to be raised rather than cut this year. I would now dwell on the reasons behind our decision. Firstly, price growth remains moderate. Average monthly price growth rates have increased compared to the end of last year, coming close to 4% in annualized terms. The acceleration of price growth in January and its further slowdown in February were largely caused by one of factors. This was especially notable in prices for electronics, construction materials, furniture and some food products. Nevertheless, the growth rate of stable components of inflation currently stay moderate. In contrast, prices for services have been rising considerably faster since uh, June 2022. Compared to prices for products, the accelerated increase in prices for services is often interpreted as a sign of strengthening inflationary pressure in the economy that requires a monetary policy response. This is associated with the fact that these prices are less sensitive to exchange rate movements and one-off factors in certain markets and are revised less frequently than prices for products. However, at the moment, it would be premature to draw an unambiguous conclusion that the quick rise in prices for services implies persistent inflationary pressure. The current increase in prices for services is attributed to two components. In the first place, there is indeed a stable component. It is associated with changes in wages as labour costs account for the largest percentage of the production cost of services. However, the second component is a catch-up growth. Beginning from the middle of last year, we have been observing the adjustment of prices for services after the pandemic and the surge in prices for products that occurred last spring. At the moment, it would be difficult to estimate the proportions of these two components in the current growth of prices for services. The adjustment will end gradually, and the growth rate of prices for services will largely depend on steady factors. We will closely analyse the data received in this regard. Households' inflation expectations considerably decreased in March. Respondents note a slowdown in inflation. Besides, they have become more optimistic about the future economic situation in the country and their personal finance prospects. Nevertheless, inflation expectations of both households and businesses are persistently elevated overall. Secondly, economic activity continues to trend upwards. The actual changes in GDP over 2022 turned out to be more positive than we expected. Public demand was an important factor that supported economic activity last year. At the beginning of this year, business activity continued to increase according to high frequency indicators, including the Bank of Russia's Business Climate Index. We have been observing notable improvements in some manufacturing sectors, construction, transportation and trade. Businesses continue to adjust to the changed environment. Of course, there are still certain difficulties with supplies of equipment and components. However, our regional branches generally report that many companies have refocused on alternatives or switched to parallel imports of investment goods. Segments focusing on domestic demand are developing. Thus, auto manufacturers in a number of regions are now increasing the utilization rates of their production capacities after a pause. Textile enterprises in the central federal district are launching their in-house apparel brands, taking the niches that became vacant. Manufacturers of paper and 
Pulp products in the northwestern federal district have managed to redirect their supplies from the external markets to the domestic one and expand the range of their products. More details about their adaptation of different industries can be found in the March issue of our regional economy report. The elimination of infrastructure and logistics bottlenecks progress. There are new warehouse complexes, terminals and transportation routes being created. These projects are greatly supported by government investments. The recovery of business activity influences the labour market as well. Real wages continue to rise across a large number of industries while unemployment is at its record low. Companies continue to abandon part-time employment schemes and the demand for workers of a wide range of professions is growing. Consumer activity remains subdued. We expect it to expand gradually. This will be driven by three factors. First of all, this is a decline in the propensity to save. Currently, people still prefer to make savings due to the precautionary motive that appeared because of rising uncertainty last year. They continue to form safety cushions, thus feeling more confident. As overall uncertainty goes down and people accumulate a certain comfortable amount of savings, their propensity to make additional savings might decrease. The second driver of consumer demand will be growth in wages and incomes. Third, households will gradually get used to the new range of products. It is restoring stage by stage and companies are creating new brands replacing those that existed, that exited the Russian market. However, consumers are still reluctant to switch to them. A specific feature of this is that the demand for repairs of equipment and clothing has risen. In other words, people probably prefer to prolong the service life of the products they have got used to, rather than purchase new items as they did previously. Nevertheless, they will sooner or later need to buy new equipment and other items. We expect that external demand will be substituted for domestic demand to an increasingly great extent, which will be driven not only by the public sector, but also by the rebound in consumer activity. We will assess how the expansion of demand will correlate with the capacities to ramp up the output of goods and services. Thirdly, monetary conditions. Monetary conditions have generally remained the same, staying neutral. Since our February meeting, yields on federal government bonds as well as credit and deposit rates have changed only slightly. Credit to the economy continues to expand. Growth rates in corporate lending remain high. A slight decline at the beginning of the year was caused by the extensive advanced funding of budgetary expenditures. They partially replaced companies' needs for short-term borrowings. Retail lending growth is moderate, while individual segments demonstrate diverse trends. Specifically, mortgage lending continues to expand fast. Growth in consumer lending is slower which is largely explained by borrowers and creditors' cautious behaviour, as well as the effect of the macro-prudential measures taken. Although bank loans remain the major source of money supply growth, the budget is becoming increasingly more important. In addition, the significant increase in ruble money supply is associated with the expansion of the demand for money and changes in the demand structure. A lengthening of payment chains and higher prices are increasing working capital needs. As external liabilities are substituted for Russian banks' loans, this process is also creating an additional demand for money. Hence, although the growth rate of ruble money supply is at a historically high level, it generally correlates with monetary neutrality. Now I would like to speak of external conditions. Since our February meeting, they have slightly worsened. In particular, there are new restrictions on Russia's external trade that became effective. On the other hand, the removal of transport infrastructure bottlenecks progresses, and there are new routes arranged for delivering exported and imported goods. Import quantities that surged in the second half of last year remain relatively stable. However, there are persistent difficulties with the sale of exports. As compared to both 2021 and 2022, export quantities are still lower. 
the lifting of anti-pandemic restrictions in China will have a positive effect on the world economy. For the Russian economy, this can mean more active mutual trade and new opportunities for exports and imports. This can also be an additional driver for the tourism industry. Assessing the external conditions, I should definitely comment on the current situation in the US and European banking systems. It has no direct effect on the Russian financial system. However, this new factor itself is increasing uncertainty about the future path of the world economy. For the Western central banks, the current situation exacerbates the problem of funding, finding a balance between monetary policy objectives and financial stability risks. On the one hand, we can see that the financial sector is vulnerable to interest rate risks and other risks. On the other hand, current inflationary pressure is persistently elevated. Combined, these circumstances might aggravate the risks of a recession in the world economy. Despite the positive data that we have seen recently for Russia, a slowdown in the world economy would involve a contraction of the demand for our exports, which might entail additional pro-inflationary pressure. I will now speak of the main risks to inflation. Our assessment of the ratio between pro-inflationary and disinflationary risks has remained almost the same. All the factors that we focused on in February are still relevant. First of all, this is the path for budgetary expenditures. We perceive their growth at the beginning of the year as their redistribution within the year. In the current conditions, budgetary expenditures offset the constraints contraction in the private sector's demand. Further on, we will consider a deviation from the announced path of fiscal policy normalization as a pro-inflationary factor. Second, this is the labor market. Staff shortages might become more acute. Migrant flows might cover labor demand to a certain extent. However, even in this case, there are still material risks that labor productivity will rise more slowly than real wages. The third risk is consumer demand trends. Households might shift from savings toward higher consumption faster and more sharply than we expect. In this case, demand might expand more quickly than supply, even considering the, the bottlenecking that we are currently observing. Finally, these sanctions might be tightened further. If the demand for export contracts, this might weaken the ruble, which will then pass through to prices. More complicated logistics and settlements and trade or rather constraints, but also push up prices for imports and reduce the opportunities to increase supply. I will now speak about our future decisions. Inflation trends are generally in line with our forecast of 5-7% this year. Economic activity is slightly better than expected. The range of the average key rate for this year is 7 to 9% per annum, and we expect to return to the neutral range in 2025. We usually update our calculation of the neutral rate in July when preparing our monetary policy guidelines. Nevertheless, we can say already now that there are three factors that will have a significant effect on it. In the first place, this is fiscal policy, namely the level of the structural budget deficit. Second, this is the risk premium for the Russian economy. Third, this is the level of foreign risk-free interest rates. Due to these factors, we will probably raise our estimate of the neutral rate. However, we will assess the contribution of each of these factors closer to our July meeting. We will make our future decisions on the key rate, considering the need to return inflation to the target in 2024 and stabilize it close to 4% further on. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, your questions now. Nastya. 
Nastel Sevilla from Interfax. Good afternoon. Uh, could you please tell us whether you have discussed any other uh, rate options um, during the board meeting apart from keeping it the way it is or um, changing uh, the uh, statement uh, phrasing? And did you want to send any signal to the market by publishing the facts that the inflationary expectations are going down? Another question is, what is your take on a possible uh, softening uh, of uh, restrictions imposed upon the capital movement, specifically in as far as the dividend uh, payment uh, are concerned from as accounts and the possibility to uh, uh, pay to the foreigners who have recently entered the Russian market? Uh, do these carry a certain risk? Can it bring to the volatility in the currency market and further on impact inflation? We considered two options, keeping the rate as it is, as well as uh, raising it. Uh, but uh, um, uh, the signal is something that we definitely reviewed as well. Yes, yes, keeping, keeping the rate. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Yes, we traditionally also looked into the signal, but because we believe that the balance of risk uh, remained the same, we thought it necessary to uh, uh, keep the kind of signal that we came out last time, and so it means that the probability of uh, uh, the key rate uh, growing is uh, stronger than the probability of it's going down. And as far as uh, sending the signal about the inflationary expectations through uh, publishing information, we published these expectations immediately as they come, even despite the fact that this is the week of uh, silence. And we made our announcement a week ago so that the market could enjoy the same kind of information that we have on our hands at the point in time when we make a decision. There was no uh, special signaling intention. But nevertheless, we took this factor into account. As far as uh, softening the uh, restrictions on um, uh, uh, towards dividends, we support this uh, proposal to liberalize the payment of dividends um, derived from the investments which uh, were made after March last year, because we don't see any risks to inflation or volatility from them, but we believe that that would raise the investment attraction and create a better trust on the part of investments, uh, investors so as to invest into the Russian economy, because the economy currently needs investments. I believe this is a very valid and proper decision. Uh, dear colleagues, do not forget to introduce yourselves and uh, uh, introduce your uh, agency, Gula, in the last row, please. Gulnara Vahitova, the Russian Gazette. Elivita Sahibzadona, you uh, mentioned that the uh, banking turbulence in the US and Swiss rings doesn't uh, uh, generate any direct impact upon our financial system. But nevertheless, has the situation affected your today's decision, apart from the fact that that is another pro inflationary factor? And in the future, um, if the crisis there becomes stronger, what will be the channel through which it may influence the Russian financial system? Uh, could it be uh, just by way of possible oil price uh, decrease or through some monetary factors, uh, say, through high inflation in those countries? And my second question, do you agree with what some analytics are saying, that the speculators have really pushed the uh, uh, rural exchange rate into fluctuation since the beginning of this year? Do you note any um, unusual movements? And the digital ruble, why, I would uh, like to ask you, there is uh, a uh, uh, expedited process in terms of um, pushing into uh, 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 discussion the law on the digital rule, because it may lead to an outflow of money from the banking system. Well, as far as the banking turbulence is concerned and the possible impact uh, uh, and uh, how it could influence our decision, yes, we definitely took this into account, because uh, against all other things being equal, it could get generate an additional pro-inflationary risks. Uh, this is exactly the way we describe it. But on the other hand, we do note uh, also a 
there's certain uh, reduction of proliferationary risks in terms of inflationary expectations, which, although we've elevated, we sense that that principally uh, conforms to our 4% target. And so the uh, dynamics and the pace of the current inflation also remains moderate. So all of the things being considered, the balance of uh, risk between proliferationary and uh, disinflationary one doesn't change. But what is going on in the external market represents additional proliferation risks. Now the main channel, nevertheless, is indeed through the demand for the Russian exportable goods, and that is the derivative, I should say, uh, from. Uh, the uh, global e economic uh, development rate because we believe that the risks to financial sector direct and negative consequences for financial uh, sector are insignificant um, because our financial system is less uh, uh, related less linked to the international financial system. I would say this is the basic thing. Now, the monetary factor indirectly definitely can also play up uh, through, let's say, the staying, uh, the global inflation staying at a high level, uh, and uh, um, uh, the prices through which we judge the price parity on our goods as well. So that could be, uh, uh, Mrs. Botkin, could you uh, add anything additional on monetary factors? Well, once again, I would like to underscore that to limit the influence of the global economy simply just by the oil prices is uh, something that you shouldn't do because you need to think um, uh, comprehensively in terms of the global trade, and if it slows down as the result of the further toughening of monetary conditions and financial environment as the result of uh, the, this uh, turbulence in the U.S. and European banking systems, uh, then this is most probably is going to be a pro-inflationary risk, as it always has been the case uh, where uh, the um, export uh, processes are going to suffer. That uh, applies to all of the exportable good prices and the terms upon which uh, these exports can take place. Now, the mid-term outlook will strongly depend upon the extent to which uh, the uh, measures uh, that uh, we are going to undertake are going to be at par of what needs to be achieved and the extent to which the foreign regulators are going to respond uh, and as far as the financial stability measures are concerned, as well as applying the key rate uh, tool set. Thank you. As far as the FX market is concerned, and um, in terms of any speculative activities, this is what we do not observe. Uh, but uh, quite rightly, there have been various exchange rate movements in the middle of March, particularly which can be explained by uh, the fact that we saw a concentration of open positions on the eve of the future contract expirations, principally because the liquidity of the FX market went down. So such fluctuations of prices uh, can happen. So together with the exchange um, institution, we are considering how to further improve uh, the trading designs as well as the fixing terms so as neutralize such fluctuations. But despite the fact that this is being explained by a normal market practices, we are definitely going to get to take a look at it and into it. So it's just to uh, exclude any manipulation exactly like we deal with any other market phenomenon. As far as an expedited reading of the uh, digital ruble draft law is concerned, there is no expedition in it. It is very much going according to schedule, both in terms of uh, testing, in terms of piloting it as well. And we uh, acknowledge some positive consequences from the introduction of the digital ruble. Some of the bank's concerns that there might be problems with liquidity is what we have discussed in detail, have been discussing throughout several months. We do not see such risks, and uh, consequently, we're going to stay the course. Dear colleagues, the next question from Kursk Online. Anna Koshinova, please. Good afternoon. 
Based on the expert assessment, the budget deficit uh, following 2022 may be one and a half, two times more than what was expected. That raises concern that there might be a greater tax pressure put upon the businesses. Now, with the secondary sanctions uh, effect growing as well as a tougher central bank rhetoric uh, towards a possible increase of the key rate, won't it lead to uh, difficulties not only in uh, the investment funding but also the current and the business operations for the Russian companies and businesses. Thank you very much for your question. I would like to underscore that a possible increase of the key rate that you are referring to is aimed at reducing inflation. And this is an absolute necessity to reduce inflation so that lending is available, particularly long term. Just imagine that we're not raising the rate, inflation is growing, uh, the credit rates at the same time are going to remain high. And it is exactly in order to make a credit resource available and accessible and for the price stability to remain when pro-inflationary risks materialize, if need be, we would be ready to raise the key rate. But going back to the beginning of your question, in order to avoid the risks and the taxes growing, as well as the key rate growing, the budget deficit might must be under control. And one ought to have a long-term budget stability in place. Yes, Alexei Belisovich, yes, another remark, if I may. If, hypothetically, in the economics, taxes are growing, then against all other things being equal, the budget deficit is becoming lower, the budget's contribution into the money supply dynamics grows down, and that reduces the need to remain a higher level of rates in the economy. Dear colleagues, Rita, please, in the first row. Thank you very much, uh, Rita Spilevska, TAS Agency. Could you please tell us, you mentioned that uh, you also considered raising the rate, uh, but only uh, at a minimum level or uh, margin, or have there been other options? And secondly, um, the Minister of Finance also said that the banks are going to participate in the contribution to the budget, and I would like to understand whether the Central Bank has says how many banks can participate. Uh, wouldn't it be uh, creating an excessive burden upon them? Thank you. We didn't have any detailed discussion in terms of uh, what is going to be the step size of uh, such rate growing. Secondly, as far as uh, the budgetary contributions by banks, um, honestly, we haven't found any good reason to offer the banks the exclusion from the general rule. Um, in this situation, the only thing, uh, meaning uh, specifically uh, the kind of position we take if the banks are going to stay under that general rule, that definitely should be the banks which are not using our regulatory easings. And colleagues, please. Rita. Margarita Mordomina from RPK Agency, I will have two questions. The first is related to the Raiffeisen and Zbeer, these two banks, which have devised a plan to swap European and Russian assets. I mean, the Raiffeisen devised it. Now, uh, is this plan being cleared through the Bank of Russia? And generally speaking, what's the regulator's uh, attitude towards uh, a situation when the Russian sanctioned banks uh, can exchange uh, uh, assets with the Western banks? And the second question about the currency Conversion. Based on our information, some of the Russian banks have come up against difficulties in converting the currency owned by the legal entities into rubles. The individuals are not facing such a problem. Uh, now, could you please tell us, do you know about such a problem and whether it requires any reaction on the part of uh, the Bank of Russia? As far as the asset swapping between the mentioned banks is concerned, we don't have any common position. You need to, we need to really look into whether we need to approve of this transaction because it may be, well be about uh, transferring money abroad and for that uh, purpose you would need to get a special approval. So far we haven't received any uh, paperwork on these two uh, points. So it's hard for me to comment as far as the difficulties in converting the uh, business owned to hard currency into uh, rubles. We haven't noticed any systemic problem here, but I will take a look at it, I promise. Svetlana Orlik, next one, please. 
Good afternoon, Svetlana Orlik, RIA Novosti. I would also like to ask a question about the most important systemic bank because recently it has become known that uh, there is a deal being prepared to change shareholders in the Alpha Bank. Could you please tell us, does this particular deal require approval by the Central Bank? Have you received any applications so far? And what kind of a decision that the Central Bank can come up with? Would it be approving it? Second question, towards the end of last year, the Russian Parliament uh, approved the limit uh, for free transfers for individuals between their uh, personal accounts uh, within 1.4 million rubles that the Central Bank of Russia was appealing for. However, the banks are dramatically against uh, uh, this uh, threshold uh, being raised. Um, now, what is uh, the Central Bank of Russia thinking about it? What should be the limitation in this particular kind of a transfer? Another uh, question, uh, please. Uh, last year, there was quite an unexpected increase of investment into uh, the uh, 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 Capital. Uh, does the Central Bank of Russia think that this growth will continue by how much and um, uh, based on what reasons? As far as uh, the Alpha Bank's uh, ownership change is concerned, we haven't received uh, anything so far. Uh, we don't understand the deal structure and whether uh, it may require any clearing by the uh, central bank. I uh, cannot tell you anything about it just yet because we haven't received any query uh, from uh, the bank itself uh, nor from its owners. As far as uh, uh, transferring one's own money for free from one bank into another bank within 1.4 million rubles threshold, our position hasn't changed. We understand that some of the banks are against it, but we believe it is of principal importance for the people to have the right and entitlement to at least as far as their savings are concerned within the deposit insured amount to be able to transfer freely from one bank into another bank. And uh, actually, we're not supporting the kind of uh, this practice with uh, high tariffs and fees and fence uh, people in within one particular bank when there's another bank which is offering more beneficial terms because that restrains competition. Our position uh, towards this particular issue is not going to change. As far as the investment into the uh, main capital is concerned, yes, there have been two dynamics since last year, which can be explained by two things. Many private investors try to finish some of the investment project that they had previously began, expecting um, further toughening of restrictions in terms of being able to import components and equipment. We saw that uh, the private investments really scrambled them. And the second important factor, public investments and corporate investments uh, from companies with government involvement, these have grown. And as far as the next year is concerned, our uh, forecast cast that we put together for our previous meetings anticipates a certain decline in investments considering the high base uh, this year and we believe that private investments shall remain refrained uh, the public investments uh, their pace is definitely going to be positive but we are going to make our assessment based on the incoming data and the need to revise our uh, forecast uh, including the investments uh, uh, can you add something yeah I mean on the, the subsequent years, and it will mean 2023. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Thank you. 2023. Dear colleagues, thank you very much. Our next question is from Tatiana Ramazanova, uh, Tuva Media Group from the Republic of Tuva. I've heard from friends that Russia started printing more money these days. Is that true? Won't it affect inflation? Well, in the modern banking system, the total amount of money supply is defined as uh, the amount of lending by the banks as well as the fiscal uh, transactions, and that creates the money supply. And that is quite normal that it is gradually growing, which reflects the fact that the economy is developing. But it is important for this money supply growth to correlate to the economic activity level and uh, the target inflation level. And basically, our f monetary policy is aimed at providing for such a correlation, in which case inflation will be within our target. 
At the same time, some of uh, the money and funds, households and businesses are using in cash the one that is physically being printed, but uh, converting uh, money from non-cash into cash as such doesn't create new money supply. If you withdraw 1,000 rubles from your plastic card from the bank machine and you get it in cash, you won't be able to spend it from your card anymore because it's not there. And although the amount of cash in the hands of the household is growing, but its uh, effect upon the inflation uh, is not uh, strengthening. But maybe it's, this question is about a different thing, because usually in our vernacular in the central banks and financial systems, uh, printing money is, means unlimited emission funding uh, of the corporates and households by the central bank. Such behavior invariably leads to inflation. And so if you do not set the boundaries for the money supply growth, prices are going to grow endlessly. We're not involved in this kind of thing. Thank you, uh, dear colleagues. Konstantin. Konstantin Siginkov, Money24, Media Project with the Petition of uh, Moscow uh, Broadcasting Channel 24. I've got two questions. My first one is, uh, being a mortgage borrower with some length of service, I would like to uh, ask you, uh, the, active bank is actively, uh, the central bank is actively monitoring uh, how the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the interest rates are being offered, you know, 1,000s, 100s, but the developers have come up with all kinds of different uh, scheming, you know, tranched mortgage and whatnot. Uh, could I ask you whether the central bank is actively involved in monitoring such situation, and what are the potential measures that the central bank have uh, has that it may resort to. My second question, regrettably, there is an increasingly frequent number of unusual uh, spikes of low liquidity stocks uh, at the exchange. Now, my question, is it accidental? Is it spontaneous? Or is it just a collusion of some sort and whether the central bank is monitoring this as well? And if I may, uh, to deviate a little bit, um, the previous colleagues already referred to, uh, very, um, uh, to the uh, banking unpleasantries in the United States and Europe. Well, the Central Bank of Russia uh, has a great, good, uh, solid experience in helping the depositors and banks. Now, if the colleagues from the European Central Bank or the Fed uh, would have called you to seek your advice as to what they should do, what would you advise them to, to do? Well, so many serious questions. As far as different mortgage schemes and tranche based uh, mortgage with a cash back, uh, we are absolutely dissatisfied with these kind of schemes. The hell knows what kind of schemes exactly as you described it. We're not only monitoring the system and we're ready to make a quick decision whenever necessary. What else we see? And actually, you can derive it from the statistics, because we see that the share of loans with the very low a startup contribution and tranche is growing, which carries um, a greater risk than uh, the uh, loans issued to people with a high uh, debt burden. Uh, I mean, the kind of people where who will have to pay to spend 80% of their income to service uh, the mortgage loans. So as of December 1st, we have raised macro markups uh, for the banks uh, for the mortgage loans with the low original um, uh, the contribution, another uh, uh, raise will be on April 1st as far as the developer offered mortgage uh, loans. Similarly, uh, higher reserves and impairments are going to be introduced for the banks who are playing part in such a skimming. We're definitely going to do that in order to provide for the financial stability, in order to avoid any bubbling. On the other hand, that is going to be a bit of a social security because uh, for the kind of uh, uh, this uh, festive party, as you describe it, people will have to pay for it out of their pocket. Definitely we're going to combat such schemes. Yet again, I will say, if they're going to grow in quantities, then we're going to be very insistent with uh, the Russian parliament in order to pass the kind of decision where such mortgage programs could take place strictly within the body of law, because any uh, uh, 
thing out of it uh, will be uh, uh, simply leading to the borrowers being deceived. As far as uh, unusual uh, spikes uh, in the low liquidity uh, share trading, uh, while well, indeed through the organized exchange trading throughout the past year the volume has gone down as well as liquidity has gone down, the free float uh, has uh, shrunk, uh, non-resident companies have gone away and many retail investors are acting very cautiously. Yes, objectively, the sensitivity, the price sensitivity towards the quality and the quantity of uh, transactions have grown, the, the, the higher volatility with the uh, low liquidity assets has always been around because uh, this is a tradition of volatility, but it has become more pronounced when the share of the Russian retail investors uh, have grown because as opposed to the institutional investors and foreign investors uh, quite often were institutional ones, the uh, retail investors very often lack specific knowledge and they are more susceptible to uh, emotional decisions which lead to price fluctuations and so certainly additional measures are necessary here. The exchange itself has instituted certain measures already in order to restrict uh, the share of aggressive um, uh, trading, in introducing certain restrictions also to the stock market and FX market, although you're referring to the stock market. Uh, certain additional options are currently being debated with the marketplace um, because um, the possibility of a discrete uh, uh, um, uh, trading, uh, certain stabilization instruments, uh, um, um, these are all being debated, but definitely that would lead to some decision making. But this is an, 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 an objective process. And we feel that certain additional measures will definitely be coming and that we monitor this situation. In as far as uh, uh, the experience in responding to the banking crisis is concerned, uh, you know, the crises are very different from country to country, from time to time period. Uh, and um, uh, I mean, the United States and the European Union do have a very extensive expertise in f fighting against such banking crises. Uh, remember 2008 and uh, during the previous decade and uh, um, uh, as part of the international standard, including the Basel I, certain measures have been adopted and macroprudential measures are being uh, followed. Uh, every country started the experience of other countries as well, but the biggest takeaway here is that the basic things as well, balanced monetary policy and a balanced uh, financial stability policy, which are capable of preventing such systemic predicaments. And these are the things that one definitely should follow. Thank you so much. The next question comes from Evgenia Pismenov from Bloomberg. Genia, please. Good afternoon. I have several specific questions uh, to follow up on the previous ones. The first one is about uh, easing the process of repatriating dividends uh, from by foreign companies from non-friendly countries. Do I understand correctly that portfolio investors whose money currently is in limbo here in Russia, uh, they don't have a chance to repatriate their dividends, but the companies who have been working in Russia for long and continue, such as Raiffeisen Bank or BP, um, if they continue investing in Russia, will they be able to take their dividends out of Russia? This is my first follow-up question. The second, in as far as the marginal discount for the Russian oil is concerned, when it was introduced before the previous board meetings, when you stated that one should still wait to assess the effect, can you say whether you already now understand what kind of uh, impact comes from it? Is it pro inflationary or disinflationary factor? And the third uh, may sound a bit funny, but seriously, uh, foreign regulators are saying that they cannot find 300 billion of uh, the uh, Russian reserves, uh, which they sanctioned while well, you quoted the 300. They are saying that they found much less and they're quoting some minuscule figures. Can it be that the Russia doesn't have this amount of uh, uh, assets uh, under the rest 
that you were successfully able to conceal it. As far as easing the rules for the repatriation of dividends, as far as the portfolio uh, investors are concerned, their dividends, and indeed we have certain restrictions which imply uh, that a decision can be made through the governmental commission um, with the Bank of Russia in the case of credit institutions, but uh, we're not expecting any changes to uh, take place here. And so uh, if any changes take place here, that would be about the uh, dividends from the kind of investments which had been done within specific uh, timing. Now, the way it may work, that requires discussion because if the company is operating to separate its current investment from the previous ones is something that must be looked into. So it is a bit premature to specifically discuss the way it uh, might work. Now, as far as uh, the uh, marginal uh, inflation discount is concerned, overall we believe that uh, with regard to inflation, these changes in terms of the oil taxes, the effect is neutral. The decision was made almost exactly timed with our February board meeting. We didn't reflect it in our forecast. But as far as, as part of the fiscal rule, the uh, fiscal spending are being set by the basic level of the oil and gas revenues that are not being reconsidered. And so the new order specifies just the size of the oil uh, rent that is being paid against a preset uh, international oil price level. So it primarily affects uh, the residual dynamics of the National Welfare Fund uh, amounts. And that is aimed at strengthening the resilience of the fiscal policy. And it ensures the budget from the risk of the oil and gas revenues not being enough. In, the, in, in a setting with intransparent pricing. But in terms of the fiscal contribution into the aggregate uh, demand is uh, uh, being assessed, and so that does affect both the fiscal system and the National Welfare Fund situation. Now, as far as our reserves are concerned, I can't help you uh, here at all with this question. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Mitri. Dmitry Batenko, Commerzant. The Federal Tax Service, um, and again, you, and you started publishing the uh, trading balance figures not uh, in such a clear way as uh, in the past, but nevertheless, we currently know the uh, amount of the um, uh, trading uh, uh, balance in January and the imports, which is staying high, not going to go down. Because of that, I wanted to go back to the previous press conference discussion because during the previous round uh, in between the board of directors, um, as you were um, reporting, uh, the decrease of the foreign currency in the banking system uh, carries a certain effect when we simultaneously should take a look at the M2X and M2 in order to assess the inflationary pressure, which may cease to uh, further evolve this year. Maybe not against the current amount of imports. Do you see that uh, this uh, process uh, is going to stop or it will continue slowly this year as well? I mean, the uh, 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 foreign currency losing its level. Well, M2, M2X, apart from this one, there is another factor that basically brings M2 growing faster than M2X, which is the substitution of external funding with the domestic one. And that is not very much reflected in the banking balances losing FX as their base. Uh, therefore, uh, and against it, a substitution of external debt with domestic one and that was a very active process last year. We believe that it shall continue remaining this year and probably next year as well, because uh, the external corporate debt, not every way, it was a short term, it was quite long term. And so if you don't have a uh, pre-term uh, settlement, this really can play out uh, for a long period of time, maybe not so intensely, but gradually, under the impact of this particular factor, the M2-M2-X rate of growth may converge. 
Well, I suppose that's the way. Maybe Mr. Zabotkin um, uh, may comment on it additionally. Yeah, with your permission, I will start by a bit of a remark uh, about uh, disclosing the trading balance data, uh, the, uh, da the chart of the trading balance publication exactly uh, looks the same as it was uh, before, uh, because even previously it was uh, being published with a 30-day, a 45-day lag after the end of the reporting period. Uh, there is a bit of a less de de details uh, as, uh, it, as pertains certain product categories. Uh, so with respect to the M2 and M2X dynamics, the substitution of external loan with the kind of loan which is generated within the Russian banking system is reflected in the way that the M2X is growing at the rate uh, which is close to the maximum values over the past several years. Meaning to say that indeed a bigger part of the money supply that uh, services the Russian economy is uh, produced from within the Russian banking system due to the fact that our uh, links to the global uh, financial system is less expressed uh, as opposed to the past. Now, the relative uh, M2 uh, dynamics compared to M2X, which was quite vivid last year, this is about the bank's balances losing the FX burden, uh, where this uh, relative correlation uh, between the ruble and uh, hard currency deposit in the liability part of the balances. Uh, so that is uh, something that uh, will be uh, quite uh, uh, reasonably uh, completed. So these two processes have been provoked by the same events, but uh, roughly speaking, these are two different dimensions in the way the banking and financial systems uh, 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 operate. Thank you. The next question comes from Oksana Poznikova, St. Petersburg TV channel. Good afternoon. I'm having more of a household kind of a question, which is about the credit cards and the so-called pre-approved credits, uh, something that I can see amongst my friends. Uh, the banks are quite aggressively uh, currently uh, trying to uh, take back the credit card that the people didn't even order, but this is not really about it. But the terms of such loans are very untransparent. Quite often we see that people don't understand what kind of an annual interest rate they have, what kind of a rate, and against, uh, let's say, their average 15% uh, per, per annum well, on credit cards that may turn out to be 30 and even more and so I'm having two questions does the central bank plan somehow to uh, toughen its control over such uh, uh, supply and secondly are there any additional programs in place to raise the financial literacy level because uh, people uh, clearly don't understand the terms upon which they are accepting these cards from the banks thank you very much this is indeed a very important and crucial question because the problems that you described is what we do encounter and we are taking measures and if there is a need we will further tighten our policy in this area because the banks, indeed, not only the banks actually, are being quite creative uh, uh, about how to sell uh, the things to people, the things that they don't uh, need at all. So we're continuously monitoring such scheming. We are trying to curtail them. Uh, we need to work closely, and that's what we do with other government agency, antitrust authorities, Russian communication oversight. Uh, for example, if an individual didn't uh, give his or her consent to be mailed any uh, b b b advertising or promotional material from the banks, you should complain to the antitrust authority because we know that our colleagues in the antitrust agency are being quite quick in responding as far as the consumer lending is concerned and the untransparency of its terms, that is a long-standing problem because currently the banks um, are obliged to disclose individual terms in a very visual, easily understandable form. And so if a uh, prospective uh, borrower doesn't get such uh, a chart, that is a violation. Moreover, if you get completely confused in the bank that you're not getting a loan but you're getting a credit card and when you come home you realize that this is not exactly what you wanted, you have 14 days, a fortnight, within which this credit card or a loan is something that you can reject without any penalty. So this is the so-called 
grace period or the cooling period. But if, but if the bank uh, refuses to accept such a card back, then a loan is a violation, direct violation of consumer rights. And then you should immediately uh, file a, a grievance uh, in our electronic um, um, uh, platform. But at the same time, you must be aware that if within 14 days you uh, used uh, the credit card or the loan, you will have to repay it back together with the interest. And so financial literacy is a principally important thing because we're running together with the Minister of Finance a whole program in order to explain more things to people, not only about the meaning of different products, but also about how you can restore your rights because information about how you can guard your rights is also of a principal importance. Well, dear colleagues, uh, please, Masha. Maria Kudyavtseva, Russia 24. Today, on more than one occasion, you mentioned about the banking crisis impact upon the global financial system. Um, my question to you, based on your expert assessment, won't they follow a domino effect of the kind of situation that we are seeing with the Credit Suisse when big investors are running away from their capital like Saudi Arabia and China? Will the monetary authorities in the West have enough money to... Uh, keep the things afloat. Well, we see that the monetary authorities are making very quick decisions in order to nip these risks. We will certainly monitor the situation. Now, in terms of the domino effect upon the Russian system is what we don't see, as I've mentioned it, because on the one hand, the Russian system is much less linked to the world financial system, and secondly, in terms of stability of our banks, they're less susceptible to the so-called vulnerability that the US and European banks demonstrate simply that they don't have such accumulated risks on their balances, which had been growing because of a long period of uh, low rates, because these risks uh, are not because of uh, the fact that uh, the central banks are raising now the key rates, but because there were very extended period of long, of low rates. Uh, and this is what you must be aware of as well. But apart from it, our experience of last year, because of such an unprecedented external shock, our uh, interest risk was uh, much bigger compared to the one that the US and European banks are experiencing. And our banks were able to persevere and uh, keep uh, their ability to lend further. But nevertheless, this is the kind of effect, as I said, that we counted uh, for in our decisions uh, in terms of the indirect uh, uh, impacts. We will definitely watch uh, out for it. Uh, so what we act upon is that the central banks and other countries have been able to uh, uh, generate certain tool set to uh, um, mend the station accordingly. The next question comes from Tatiana Chubasova into facts. Tanya, please. Good afternoon. I've got several questions. The first one, whether the central bank participated in discussing the idea of placing the topical or uh, patriotic bonds and uh, what uh, does the central bank think about this idea? Second question, has anybody at all was able to get a positive response from uh, uh, about the unblocking of the uh, Russian held assets by Euroclear? And the third question about very important event for the stock market. Uh, the uh, um, announcement back by the Sbear Bank in terms of the dividend uh, payment because they are planning towards the end of the year to pay not only out of the last year's profits but also from the undistributed profits. Now, if other banks, following Sbear's example, would uh, decide to share with their shareholders undistrib undistributed profit, won't that carry a risk for the capital structure of the banks? Well, as far as the topical bonds of different sorts are concerned, uh, we didn't participate in the discussion of this. 
Um, so in terms of our position uh, towards such uh, bonds is what I'm not ready to express. As far as uh, unblocking uh, the uh, assets, uh, even if there are separate positive things and cases, of course, it is very important uh, for us to understand uh, that uh, um, uh, as many investors uh, who suffered from it could uh, be reinstated in their entitlements. And so this is the kind of work that we are conducting with investors in the hope that their rights will be uh, uh, secured. As far as the possibility for the banks to pay dividends, uh, won't it uh, uh, impact their financial stability? You know that we have made a decision, this is within our authority, a regulatory decision to the extent that the banks um, can pay dividends in the amount of up to 50% if they adhere to the kind of uh, the same kind of schedule by setting up the impairments and uh, increasing the markups uh, the, in relationship to which we uh, granted a certain easing in the course of five years. And so if they stick to this uh, schedule, I mean the banks, that they can pay 50 percent. There are no restrictions uh, with regard to the banks who uh, will bring back their markups uh, within the framework of the rules which existed before February last year, which means that there are no risks uh, in terms of the uh, capital adequacies that we see, if they're not using any of our regulatory easings and they have sufficient capital, even uh, compared to the standards uh, that were in effect in the past, we don't see a need to restrict anything. But without doubt, uh, the owners of every bank should make up their minds based on the need for the bank's future development and as well as the need to ensure um, the sustainable lending potential. Thank you. Um, the colleagues of Guinea, please, here. Good afternoon. Uh, Yevgeny Popov, Invest Future. My question is this, bearing in mind everything that is currently going on in the West, is there any um, connection that the Central Bank of Russia might have with the Western Central Bank in order to keep track of what is happening there? I mean, just uh, in order to be well informed uh, uh, or pre-informed whether or not going to go into another financial crisis. Now, uh, whatever is going on there, does it generate any impact upon the frozen asset? Uh, and uh, um, what is the way that any uh, additional contributions uh, or forceful contributions may impact inflation? You mean uh, the contribution from the businesses? This is obligatory ones? Well, yeah, we do maintain contacts with the central bank, primarily with those who are eager to maintain contact with them because we practically don't have any contacts with the Western banks. But uh, nevertheless, uh, in as far as information about what is going on is quite uh, um, in the public domain, and so we are able to assess it. And once again, I shall underscore that uh, in terms of what is happening in the uh, Western financial markets there, is a very limited, a very limited effect from it on the Russian financial system. So we don't think that this would in any way affect uh, the situation with the frozen asset. This is a whole separate issue that must be resolved uh, through uh, uh, interaction between investors and our depository system with the Western regulators. But that is a whole separate track. Now, in as far as uh, the uh, uh, business contributions and whether they might push up inflation. I mean, this kind of an impact can come from investment demand from the private companies in terms of uh, the extent to which this particular contribution might uh, alter or might impact the investment decisions. There's no direct correlation, but that might you know, impact the individual business decision to continue investing, to curb investment, to uh, make long-term business plans, but there's no practically direct impact, if you will. Alexei Borisovich, would you like to say something? Yeah, short term. Uh, this is exactly what we're talking about, because if these are the funds which uh, companies would otherwise 
uh, direct at additional investments, and that investments won't take place because uh, this money is what the government will have, well, short term, that would contract the overall demand against such additional income being directed at funding the already planned spending by the government. So there would be a neutral effect. But midterm, uh, undoubtedly, the intensity of investments does impact uh, the dynamics of the economic potential. So the midterm outlook, uh, there could be more complex effects playing out. Thank you. Next question comes from Victoria Shergina, Law and Finance, please. Good afternoon. Uh, one other question about the digital ruble, if I may. It is being introduced uh, very shortly, and I won't exaggerate if I say that some of the household are quite worried by this perspective. And so the people would like to ask you to comment two main points. First, whether you are planning to substitute the cash ruble entirely with the digital one, if positive, then when? And the second question is, is there an expiration date for the digital ruble? Because households are quite worried that the digital rubles are going to get burned if they don't spend them quick enough. Well, first of all, I would like to say that we're going to introduce it in a staged way, in a very prudent uh, way. There's not going to be any substitution of one form of money with another. Administratively, we will simultaneously have uh, the cashless, non-cash ones, as well as the cash, and the digital rubles in the electronic purses, in the form of tokens. That would broadens people's uh, option set. There's no going to be any limitation in terms of the time frame, no expiration. There cannot be any. Thank you so much, Marina. Marina Piminova, NTV Business News. The central bank is not, uh, has not been changing the key rate for the fourth board meeting in a row. What does it mean? Is it about stability, stagnation, or does the central bank can offer a different definition to this phenomenon? I don't even know how to give you a short answer. Alexei Borisovich, maybe you can help me. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this excellent question. In fact, uh, uh, being half serious about it, I think this is really great that we don't have to change the rate at all uh, for that for the four board meetings in a row over the past few years. That is not uh, a frequent occurrence, but that in itself uh, means that the current uh, rate level completely uh, in conformity with the current economic environment and our expectations. And so depending upon the measure to which this particular view is going to change will define its future trajectory. Maybe I should also add by saying that our key rate decision, any, whether we raise it, whether we lower it, whether we keep it as is, are being aimed at keeping inflation close to 4% in case it runs away from it and sustain it further within that marker. So it is aimed at price stability, because if we talk about stabilization, so that's price stability. Thank you so much. Uh, Sergei, please. Sergey Bolotov, arguments and facts. My first question is about cheap insurance coverage that people get for their mortgage lending because people are trying to save on this and as a result their <coughs> uh, insurance doesn't cover certain illnesses such as uh, cancer and so people sometimes are being left unemployed because uh, that's the way it happens. Isn't there a certain um, you know, area for the regulation? Wouldn't the central bank forbid such a thing? And my second question, could you please expand uh, in terms of your comment about what is going on in the West? If Jerome Powell on May 22nd is going to let the American market plummet, will our market follow suit or we are being quite autonomous and all of the bad things have already happened to us? Well, cheap insurance policies, when people are not paying anything and don't, are not getting anything. I mean, they're paying a lot but not getting anything. That is exactly the problem uh, as to why we started raising this issue about the consumer value within various financial products. If it's an insurance coverage, it should insure one from certain situations and people must get compensated without any problem at all. And that is why we're looking into different products like that in order for the household to truly uh, have the value from it. And the problem that you described is what we're going to continue responding to. Now, 
As far as um, whether uh, the uh, central bank's decisions uh, in the United States and European could impact us, well, they're having a serious problem in terms of uh, maintaining a correct balance in terms of between the reducing the uh, uh, inflation, and maintaining the financial stability when uh, the rates are growing, the interest risk is growing, and the risk to financial stability is becoming more pronounced indeed. What we come from is that it is not only about the monetary policy thing, because any central bank maintains a certain instrument to maintain both the price stability and financial stability. In the case of financial stability, if you recall last year, we went through that period when we offered various regulatory um, uh, easings and various mechanisms through which liquidity could be made available. But without doubt, making a decision about the monetary policy in as far as the rate is concerned, that does impact financial stability. So if you toughen it too much, you may end up having a certain turbulence in the financial market, uh, uh, not least uh, the financial stability. Therefore, I mean to say that when any central bank is making such a decision, when they're facing such a dilemma, I recall our case, of course, the financial stability issues become a priority. Because last year we raised the key rate up to 20%, amongst other considerations, because uh, to be able to uh, curtail the risks to financial stability. And I believe that the central banks are going to utilize all the instruments available to them in order to avoid such risks. There are other expectations. There is another way about it. Being afraid of the financial stability risks, the central banks, on the contrary, shall slow down their rate of toughening monetary policy and would allow for a higher inflation, in which case, the inflation in the reserve currencies is going to be at higher levels, but in our mind that will still require, at a later point in time, a much greater toughening in these countries, because after some vulnerabilities in the accumulated debt will lose value because of inflation, they will still have to do it, and that would create an effect upon the global uh, growth. So if the balance of things goes one side or the other side, we're going to be impacted by it through the global economy economic growth rates because they may slow down in both cases. If you don't follow the precise path between Silla and Haribda, because that might uh, impact the global growth and uh, consequently the demand for our exportable goods. But in terms of direct impact and uh, our financial system catching on, uh, this disease, no, we're not uh, so strongly related to the global financial system. But undoubtedly, these are all of the points, all of the considerations that we discuss and consider. Would you like to add something, Mr. Zabotkin? Well, it's very difficult to add anything to it. But once again, the important thing is that the problems and this uh, um, span of choices that the regulators in the US and Europe are facing is the result of the fact that for quite some time, zero rate policy was being pursued as a result of which the banks have a lot of assets on their balances that had been acquired at very high prices, um, you see. And so right now, as the monetary policy is uh, becoming normalized in order to conform to uh, stable inflation close to targets, it turns out that the value of those assets is fundamentally lower. So you might describe it that the uh, risk assets are being purchased as non risk risk ones, and so they simply lost value right now. Yeah, why? Well, yes, uh, and we haven't had a period like that within our monetary policy history, and that is why we don't have such vulnerabilities in our system principally. Thank you so much. The next question comes from Alexander Savelyev uh, from End Time publication in Nizhny Novgorod. Will the Bank of Russia uh, raise the key rate in the future? Does it make sense to open up a deposit right now or just wait a little bit and uh, open it up at a more attractive rate? While some are waiting in the, for us, uh, hopefully, that we shall raise the key rate? My goodness. Well, indeed, we sent 
a signal that we may raise the key rate if pro-inflationary risks materialize. On the one hand, as I said, uh, the inflationary background over the past few weeks was quite restrained. The household inflation expectations went down. On the other hand, we have an additional pro-inflationary risk because of the turbulences in the U.S. financial system and the price expectations on the part of the businesses remain high. Therefore, we are currently seeing that the balance of risk compared to the last term hasn't changed. What does it mean? It means that the probability of the key rate being raised is there, but this is not something predetermined, not by default. So speaking about the households who are making their decisions to uh, deposit money uh, in a bank or not to, first and foremost must think about their financial targets because you may expect the uh, rate to grow, which might not happen, but throughout that period of time, if you keep your money under a mattress, you're going to lose the interest income that you might have uh, got in case you put your money into the deposit now. So you simply just calculate it. Now, dear colleagues, Tatiana, please. Good afternoon, Tatiana Voronova, Frank Media. I got two questions and two follow-up questions, if I may. It's altogether four. My first question is that the Moscow Exchange, as we understand, as uh, advised by the central bank, didn't follow its own dividend policy and dividend payment uh, following the end uh, year end is something that the investors were not very much uh, joyfully accepting. And so I would like to understand now the central bank, who is actively saying that the rules of the game for investors must be transparent, what kind what kind of objective did you try to pursue by agreeing or rather by recommending company, to companies such compromise kind of payments because obviously it's not that you wanted not to pay at all but uh, the kind of uh, the expected dividend payment bar, the actual payments uh, were not able to reach. Another question is also by the central bank, the spare bank which paid uh, very uh, uh, Tangible dividends and uh, Hamlin Graf used to say that uh, it uh, basically uh, made it uh, uh, no longer necessary to return uh, the crisis support money uh, to the Treasury. Now, what do you think about the government's ability to play other, to help other players uh, in case they need it uh, against the uh, spare banks not repaying it money? Will you believe? any additional instruments will be required to maintain the uh, capital adequacy. Another question about the Alpha Bank and the mortgage lending. About Alpha Bank, whether this transaction takes place or not, doesn't take place, we see that there is a bit of a movement back to the start of the 2000s when proprietors were trying to solve their problems uh, by being in the sanctional list, by redistributing shares in favours of a partner uh, who, if the transaction was to be based on cash never would have been able to afford it. So what's your added towards this as being something of uh, a uh, uh, backward movement? In Frank Media, we are very attentively following the developers' um, cooperation with the banks in terms of mortgage lending. Based on our recent monitorings, we see that the zero-based mortgaging is living itself out, and it turns itself into 3 to 4 percent, but the markup on uh, the residential space hasn't gone anywhere. The Minister of Construction, towards the end of last year, described this particular option as a compromise-based one. Does the Central Bank agree to such a compromise? And do you coordinate uh, your activities somehow with the Minister of Construction? Thank you. So many questions. So the first one about the exchange. Moscow Exchange. Well, uh, first of all, the principal approach is that a very clear-cut dividend policy following it uh, is something that is so crucial to maintain investor uh, trust uh, and uh, the, to increase the level of uh, economic attraction. Uh, this is very important. However, on top of it, there is a certain corporate governance rules whereby in the annual report to disclose, to explain the reasons as to the size of the dividends if they do not conform to the dividend policy. That is something that may happen. Everybody understands it. Of course, in every and each case, this is being dealt with separately and individually by companies, so there can be certain comparisons, but one shouldn't say that everybody should decide in the same way. 
because here you deal with the future development plans of a business. You have to act on the current situation so as to meet the needs in terms of funding the corporate development and uh, running various investment projects which ensure long-term profitability uh, or investment. This is the token for uh, the ability to enjoy profit uh, continuously. Uh, particular attention is required towards the dividend policies by the companies where you find certain regulatory uh, requirements as to the capital adequacy. I mean, we are talking here about the banks and the infrastructure, um, uh, companies in the financial sector. Indeed, the Moscow Exchange uh, Advisory Board made a decision about to temporarily put and hold its dividend policy in as far as the minimum amount of profit that is attributed to dividend payments, and they are planning to update their dividend policy. Now, is it possible? Yes, it is, because dividend policies may be updated, particularly if the situation is changing somehow, and within the current geopolitical environment, uh, I suppose this is is quite a possibility. It's just that you need to do it in a transparent way and uh, communicate these, these decisions to investors and to the market in order for investors to understand, to buy the logic of the dividend policy update. This is my comment on the first question. Now, as far as uh, uh, the uh, repayment of the subordinated uh, loans and the possibility to additionally capitalize through that subordinated loan and other banks. Well, first of all, uh, it's the government who holds this subordinated uh, uh, tool because if it were to be repaid, what would it apply to? And secondly, as far as additional capitalization of banks is concerned, indeed some of the banks do need it and uh, work is, on, is ongoing with the proprietors for this additional capitalization to take place according to plan within respective periods of time. Um, uh, uh, for the adequacy to be restored, bearing in mind the uh, markup easings that we are granting, oh, I'm sure that it will be done. As far as a backward movement, I really do not see any backward movement in such uh, dealings. And so, I mean, the rationale uh, based on which they do is something that you should ask the owners about. But if this particular transaction comes up to our approval, we will definitely assess it uh, to make sure that it conforms to all of the legislative requirements, including um, um, our um, assessment of uh, the entity which uh, requires the stock, because there are various legal requirements and we will strictly follow that. Next, again, as far as the uh, developer offered uh, mortgage lending is concerned, indeed the Ministry of Construction offered something, 3 to 4 percent. We don't accept it because it uh, keeps up uh, the fundamental drawbacks. You're absolutely correct. It uh, eventually leads to the same kind of a markup on the price of the housing that individuals and households are going to buy. And they end up being in the same kind of situation. They end up uh, the owners of uh, the housing that uh, the next day after the transaction is closed uh, loses its value. And they remain with this uh, loan. Uh, so, of course, we don't believe that this is a working option. We have been debating this since autumn. We know all of the arguments, but I would like to note that this is within the authority of the Central Bank, and we will make up our minds and make the final decision based on our authority. Dear colleagues, our time is coming to an end. Our last question from Maria, please. Maria Kobo from Izvestia Gazette. Uh, the, in online, we can see, see have some banking being available. And so uh, the question is, should we be using this particular decision in Telegram, or the banks should be told to uh, uh, stop their integration with the Telegram? And additional little question about the situation with the banks in the West. Uh, were such problems expected by you? Uh, does it mean that the global crisis is about to start? As far as um, the bank's cooperation with the social networks is concerned, and specifically the foreign messengers, and this is possible in uh, the part which doesn't fall under the prohibition of the law, which came into force as of March 1st, and uh, so um, any personal data uh, transfer, um, payment documents, I mean, regular communication, I suppose, is possible, uh, and of course, 
The banks find it much more comfortable to work with messengers and individuals also enjoy this comfort. So it is also important to have the Russian managers with respective skill set and for there to be competition so that the banks won't be dependent upon one kind of a messenger. But uh, currently this process is underway, bearing in mind the fact that the law is uh, uh, out there already and it must be complied with. Now, as far as whether the problems, um, whether we expected uh, uh, these problems to uh, happen in the uh, foreign financial and the banking uh, uh, market. Well, and as far as these specific problems are concerned, Hardly anybody expected it, but as Mr. Zabotkin mentioned, the vulnerabilities were getting accumulated. That was very clear. And the risks to the financial stability against the interest rates getting higher uh, could definitely materialize. Uh, I mean, they have been there already, but simply they uh, kind of uh, jumped out of the box, so to say. And I believe that many central banks, once again, I shall say, have the tool set that they can resort to in order to nip such risks. There is an understanding of disbalances, uh, and uh, we believe that that won't uh, lead uh, to any global crisis. Mrs. Zabotkin, what do you want to say? Simply just to emphasize that this was not part of a base scenario. Uh, this kind of a large-scale uh, global financial crisis is not part of the base case scenario that we uh, follow. We simply want to say that the risk of such a scenario unfolding is greater. If it happens, that is going to be a pro-inflationary risk. And this kind of a scenario was uh, separately described within the main guidelines of the monetary policy published in October. Just uh, And uh, by way of a possible case, we described a very tough uh, option of it. I'm not trying to say that they're following it, but uh, as one of the sources of these risks that we were trying to describe, was exactly what we had in mind when we were making our plans. I mean, the risk-based scenario was even tougher one that uh, we um, were trying to um, base our decision-making upon. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Thank you.